This animated film went through a lot before production ever started. It was supposed to be made by Disney, but when John Lasseter came in, he rejected it. Then Miramax wanted to do it, but then they closed the company down. Then director Adam Elliott was asked to make it, but he didn't want to do it. Finally, Stars Animation, the people from Toronto that made Nine, came in and decided to make it. So after all the rejections, did Stars prove that one man's trash is another man's treasure? Or did John Lasseter really do the right thing to ditch this idea? Let's find out. The Story The story is best described as Romeo and Juliet for dummies. I don't mean that as a bad thing, I mean that this is the simplest way to explain the classic Shakespearean tale. Like, instead of the Montagues versus the Capulets, it's the Red Gnomes versus the Blue Gnomes. No, not like... actually... yeah. They stick to the play pretty well, except for one part because, well, kids are watching. And I'm not really happy about that little change because they replaced it with a cliché. I'm not gonna say what it is, but let's just say that it's somewhere in the end. But I do have to admit they did something to cleverly get away with it before the ending happened. The one big flaw with the story is that it doesn't give us anything new. This is pretty much Romeo and Juliet meets Toy Story, because the whole things come to life when no one's around. What they give us in story is not really bad, but it's just that it's something that we've already heard of before. The Animation For an animation studio that we've rarely heard of, the animation in this film is pretty impressive. I love that they give attention to the detail on the gnomes, and the fact that they are ceramic, like someone have a little bit of chips here and there, the way how the gnomes are painted, and more. On a side note, I also love the sound editing on the film. Almost every movement from blinking to walking always involves a little clank or something. If you saw the film, you know what I mean. But other than that, there's nothing else that the movie has to offer. The rest is just grass, a house, those simple things that we all see in other films. I guess the only other thing that I like other than the gnomes in the animation are the lawnmowers. It's pretty cool how they use them as race cars. And I like the big battle scene at the end. So, in all, I like the gnomes, I like the lawnmowers, but the rest is nothing new. The characters. Now here's the movie's strongest point. Gnomeo and Juliet features some great and fun characters. The title characters are pretty likable, and sometimes they can be witty as well. Though there are a few jokes that are pretty bad, like let's go kick some grass. On the blue side, the more memorable characters are Shroom, who is pretty cute, and Benny, who is just hilarious. Personally, he's my favorite character in the movie. On the red side, we got Tibble, who is not that bad of a villain and funny along with Fawn and the tiny red gnomes. Nanette can be funny as well, but then she could get annoying as it goes on. And what the hell's with that red gnome with the Borat swimsuit? And then there's Featherstone, who many people say that they adored him because of one heartbreaking moment. Although I do like that scene, the character itself reminds me too much of Ray from The Princess and the Frog. Heck, he's even voiced by the same actor, Jim Cummings. The biggest surprise in this film is that there are so many big names that make an appearance in this film, giving out an amazing performance, like Michael Caine, Maggie Smith, Dolly Parton, Ozzy Osbourne, his performance was surprisingly great, Patrick Stewart, and my personal favorite, Hulk Hogan. Even if some are mostly hit and miss, the characters will be the reason why you'll be happy that you saw this film. Romeo and Juliet is a fun-filled adventure, but it doesn't really give us anything new. You may argue that a movie starring garden gnomes is a first, but everything else has already been done elsewhere. Even the soundtrack is something that we've heard of before. It contains almost nothing but Elton John songs like Crocodile Rock or Hello Hello. 
I know that he's the executive producer, but do we really have to put Elton John's songs everywhere, even in the score of the movie? I kid you not, the only non-Elton John song in this film is the theme of the Enchanted Tiki Room, and even that one I'm starting to question it. If there's ever a sequel for this film, Elton has no choice but to appear as a garden gnome. With Borat's swimsuit.